So today we, before starting to dig into the HTML and browser stuff, uh, we have a leftover from, the, from last week, uh, thanks to the projector issues that we have, uh, uh, we lost some time. Um, I hope this time would have been uh, useful because uh, uh, maybe you gained a little more confidence with the promises, uh, so all the dang and catch stuff uh, that you uh, play with in the, in the lab in last uh, Thursday. And uh, uh, today we are going to add uh, another mechanism uh, that uh, lets us use the same promises that we studied last week. Okay, so uh, this async and await are new keywords in the, in the language. I'm not afraid of all this. Um, a new keywords in the language that will let us uh, use promises in a simpler way from the syntax point of view. So nothing will change about the execution order, about the synchronicity, about uh, uh, all the stuff we already know, uh, but with a simpler syntax. Now, see, these are new keywords. They were all introduced in the 2017, so a couple of years after the big JavaScript revolution. And uh, uh, two new keywords were introduced into the language, async and await. Okay, so there are, um, we already know that the promises basically rely on the promise object and on the then and catch callbacks, right? Uh, the same functionality can be obtained or similar functionality can be obtained with these new keywords, and today we'll learn how to use them, uh, in a totally interoperable way, okay? So we can mix and match the traditional promise syntax and the new async and await syntax as we want, because at the end of the day, the promise object is the one you know, that is working, okay? And this behavior is still the same. Uh, the... Um, these two keywords work together and they have slightly different, uh, uh, let's say, meanings, but they work well together. Async is a, is a modifier for functional definitions. So you can define a function in any of the ways that we know how to define functions, and you can declare that function to be async. Okay? An async function uh, means that that function will return a promise meaning that the function code is, let's say, normal code, you don't see an explicit uh, promise object being created. The promise object is created automatically by the async keyword, we may say, and whatever you return from this function with a normal return statement, it will be turned <coughs> into a promise. Okay, so when you call an async function, you see a normal function, but actually the result of this function is wrapped into a promise. That means that the function returns immediately, and then the callback can be called later on. So what we wrote uh, earlier, uh, return a new promise and do stuff, is not simplified, but just saying that that function is a thing. Okay? Um, for example, we have this function. We declare this to be an async function. And you see a normal return statement. It looks like a regular function. But since it's a, it's a sync, this value it will be the um, fulfillment value of a promise. So the function itself returns a promise. And when this is fulfilled, the, the return value will be the string test. In fact, we may call this function and apply the then callback to it. So you see, you see that we are a call in then, huh? it's clear that the return value of this function is not a string, it's a promise. And then when the promise is resolved, we are logging whatever we receive, okay? Uh, so this is a, a simple syntax for doing the same thing. If we go back to the exercise that we did last week that we copied in week four, let's make it a bit, a bit larger. Uh, last week we had this exercise about the question and answer database. And we had, uh, for example, this get answers function 
that uh, uh, operate with the database and return the new, a promise and so on. We can rewrite the same function using this new keyword just by getting rid of all the promise boilerplate code. <laughs> Meaning that this function answers two, for example, is an async function and that will execute normally this code. Uh, in this case, it's a bit more complex because the code is asynchronous itself, okay? Um, so, we'll, we'll see better how it works. Uh, if we, no? uh, but ba basically, we can use the same code and call the function in the same way. What else? Get answer dot then and whatever, okay? So this is a first simplified syntax. The second keyword, await, is the substitute. So we can read async as a substitute for new promise. And we can think await as a substitute for then. Okay, so uh, if we use await in front of a statement, Okay, this slide is, is explaining that we are creating an implicit promise for any asynchronous function. Await is, uh, can be used in front of any expression. So when we expect the result of a function to be a promise, normally what we do is to promise any function, does then, and inside the then callback, we process the value, okay? So the actual sequential code is inside the then statement, the then callback. With await, we are turning things around. And uh, await, you know, in, in a sense, stops the execution of the function. And until the expression that is a promise, that returns a promise, until this expression returns and resolves this promise. OK? And the, value returned by the await expression, that the await keyword, is the fulfillment value of the promise. So we can use it and store it into a variable. So this is a significant difference. In our code, okay, when we, like last week, when we write code like this, we know that the code executes immediately, goes through, and then the values, will be available in time, later on. Uh, with await, we would stop the execution right there, so the execution does not proceed, it's more sequential-like. Okay, we are stopping the execution until the promise returns, and so we can continue the execution with the actual value being returned. So for example, this code, if we just if we don't want to change anything, uh, the first uh, promise, the first method called a get question with a value which you call question. So in this case, I would write a const question equal to await uh, ql dot get question number one. Okay, so it looks like, okay, it looks like uh, um, that we are stopping the execution of the code here at the right at line 82. Wait until the get question promise is resolved, get the, the fulfillment value and store it into question. And then we can use this value and go on. So for example, we have uh, to get all the answers. So we have all the answers, await ql dot uh, what get answers of this question. 
So instead of having a chaining of then callbacks, we just have a sequence of a weight statement, a weight expression. What happens here is that the code running this, or the, the function running this code is automatically turned into a promise. So all the promises are automatically handled, and of course, answers is the resolution of a promise. So in some way, there should be some invisible object that is a promise that will be waited on. It's just that we don't see it explicitly. Now, because function get answer still returns a promise. Whether we declare it uh, in a traditional way or we declare it with a, with a sync keyword, it will return a promise. We are unpacking this promise and storing the result here. For doing that, the function in which these instructions are written should be asynchronous itself. Because the function, so for example, this code would be a problem because we are writing that in the main body of the, of the, of the, um, of the code. But if we had to wrap this into a question, in the, into a function, for example, query stuff, for example, You see that the moment in which you're putting this instruction inside the function, you get an error. And this error is because since we are processing and returning promises, await expressions are only allowed within a sync functions, or at the top level of modules, which is a sync by definition, okay? even if we didn't uh, realize it until now. Okay, so any uh, await instruction can only be used from inside an async function. And the syntax will stop you from doing uh, elsewhere. So, for example, you can, at this point, uh, return answers. And this is clear because you cannot return a value until the promises are returned. So what, the, what you are actually returning here, answers, is not the value but is the value wrapped into an implicit promise. So we are creating and destroying promises in an invisible way. Okay, get question, returns a promise, this promise is resolved, the uh, uh, fulfillment value is extracted and stored into this, which is a normal variable, that will be an object. Then this object is passed to an asynchronous function they will return a promise. So uh, the get answer will create a promise, as we said, either explicitly or by declaring it a sync. And uh, uh, we wait for this promise, we extract the fulfillment value, then we can forget about this promise, and we just have a list here, an array. And this return statement takes this array and uh, use it as a fulfillment value of the implicit promise corresponding to this function. So this function, uh, so function, sorry, a sync function. Is this where? Um, this function query, since it's a sync, it will return immediately a promise. Okay? And the promise will resolve when all these operations are completed with these answers variable. Okay? So, for example, we can call query with the normal same then callback, and then we get the, the answers and do something, answers, and we can do something with those answers. Or, or we can uh, answer to just await for its execution. 
these two forms are equivalent so we can mix and match uh, the traditional form and the await form as we like okay we just be aware that if we are using await uh, we should be we must be inside an async uh, environment which is normally an async function of course the only thing we cannot do or you can but it's a different meaning something like answer three is query okay so it's so we read with the OI this is not wrong but we should be aware that in this case answer three is the promise object itself which is still unresolved so in this case we are falling back to the normal you know, execution of the sequential statements but the real values will be returned later when answers will uh, resolve okay so ju let's just be confused uh, if we have an async function it returns a promise so we either then it or we or we await it always okay unless we want to store the, the promise object itself uh, for processing it in, in some way or later maybe or okay so this is just uh, you see it doesn't change uh, the meaning of what is happening the semantics of the asynchronous operations it will change significantly the syntax because for example these two instructions are probably much clearer than the equivalent uh, code that we have here these two are equivalent these snippets of code are equivalent probably the second one is clearer the drawback is that, of course, inside this function, we are, let's say, going one step at a time, okay? So if we have another instruction here, if, sorry, it will need to wait until all the promises are resolved. Instead, if we have another instruction here, it will be executed immediately. So it depends whether we want to schedule a lot of stuff and then go on, or inside this function, or say we have one function that has all the sequential operation and we schedule this function as a whole create an async function where all the things will happen in time and we go we say to this function go and we do other stuff instead instead, instead here we are you know more, we have a more fine-grained control over what we want to execute right now and what we want to delay but since they are interoperable we can no, use it and, uh, as we want. Of course, if we are, if we are using all the, let's say, callback style asynchronous operations, normally it's better, it's easier to use an explicit promise. Mm -hmm. Basically, because we cannot easily return from this callback. So the return value from here is, so we should define a second callback, it will be more, more, more complex. The promise syntax is easier in this case than a sync. But when we see other primitives, like, for example, the fetch instruction that we use for uh, connected to a web server, um, that will be um, asynchronous by definition, they already return promises. If you are using a library that returns promises, usually you know, it will be easier to use a wait instead of uh, doing all the, all the stuff. But it's your choice. No? Um, there's one final point, which is what happens if something goes wrong, because we know that promises can fulfill or can be rejected, okay? Can succeed or can fail. Um, in the normal promise uh, say object, we have the catch method, and also finally, that we can use it to deal with these uh, uh, misbehaviors, okay? So what happens with a wait? In a wait, we only have one return value. So the good value and if there is some exception here well the good news is that await not only turns uh, the fulfillment value into a normal return value but it also turns a fa um, promise failure into a normal exception so we can deal with the this with the try catch block 
with a normal try catch block and here we can deal sorry uh, about the indentation okay here we can deal with the failure of this so wh whether the first or the second promise will uh, if the first or second promise uh, uh, fails, so it's also reject, that reject value will be transformed into an exception that can be captured by the catch code. So we are using the sequential try catch to capture asynchronous exceptions, exception failures, okay, rejections of, of promises. So again, the code looks very familiar because it looks uh, sequential. But of course, uh, this is not a normal try catch because we know that this will be a scheduled function. So we'll be executing in another context. If the promise calls uh, reject, then the cache block will be executed here. So we are jumping asynchronously from one function to another. But I think it's it's cl much clearer uh, what we are doing here. So the re with await, the return value, the fulfillment value of the promise, the resolve, the parameter of resolve is available as a normal expression result. The value in the, in the um, reject callback is available as the exception argument. In this case, I'm you know, exploiting also the fact that they have more than one promise here and they put, I put both, both of them in the same try catch code. So you can also factor uh, some operation instead of being forced to handle them by one by one. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of flexibility in this syntax. Um, okay, so this just the examples where we are transforming you see uh, a sequence of then issues, uh, uh, then uh, promises into a sequence of await statements. Just remember, we must put them into an async function if we want them to work. We are going to use this uh, syntax a lot uh, in, the, in the browser when a web application needs to contact a web server to get some data. And the, uh, we are, will use the fetch API. Okay, that fetches uh, a page, a content over a DHCP protocol, and the result is a promise. So uh, we obtain the result and we uh, extract the content of the result, we parse the JSON. All of these are asynchronous operations because what you can do with a, a promise result is only, if you have an asynchronous value, you can only process it in an asynchronous way. Okay, you cannot process it synchronously because it's not ready yet. And so we we'll have a sequence of await uh, statements uh, uh, that process the different steps uh, of the result. Uh, this is what happens, it's very simple code because fetch already returns a promise and so we can process it uh, in, in this way. Okay, so we'll go come back to this code after three or four weeks from now. Hmm? Okay. Um, okay. So that was it. Okay, so we can, let me maybe break the video.